Hello, I'm Brian Eckhouse, and I'm an energy reporter at Bloomberg News in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by Jigger Shah, the new executive director of the U.S. Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office. This was the agency that helped propel Tesla in the company's younger days. Jigger has had many roles in climate and renewables. He founded Sun Edison. He was CEO of the Carbon War Room. He co-founded Generates. He's also a longtime podcaster and mentor to a generation of clean tech entrepreneurs. Jigger, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, Jigger, what is the Loan Programs Office and what about it convinced you to leave the private sector? Well, the Loan Programs Office is really this bridge to bankability. We have long had a tremendous amount of innovation in our country, right? Just from the Arab oil crisis when the Department of Energy was uh, created all the way till today, we have just thousands of technologies that we have done uh, fundamental research on. But what ends up happening is they get to pre-commercialization and then they stall. And we don't see them going all the way to scale, which is what we need to decarbonize our electricity grid by 2035 and decarbonize our country by 2050. And so when you think about the loan programs office does, is we're backed up by 10,000 scientists and engineers who really know their stuff. And so we can take perceived technology risk, technologies that scare commercial banks, but don't scare us because we've read all the demonstration data and other things. And we can provide financing for first of a kind plants, for the second plant, third plant, to be able to get that data set in place to get mainstream private sector investors uh, interested in taking that sector over from us. Got it. You said on a recent episode of the Energy Gang podcast that you were more terrified than excited by this challenge. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Well, the thing is, is that when I left uh, Sun Edison and joined the Carbon War Room, right, it was just a whole different set of muscles, right? I mean, fundraising, doing all those things. In this new job, you know, working with the secretary who's been amazing, working with Congress, working with this extraordinary team we have at LPO, these are not muscles that, you know, I've spent 25 years, you know, making strong and, and perfecting. Um, you know, luckily, as I've been in the job for about six weeks now, uh, people have been very gracious to me. So I've been able to really uh, get up to speed quickly. People have really helped um, and I needed a lot of it. So <laughs> so I'm more excited than terrified now. But uh, going in, I wasn't sure what to expect. Got it. Becoming into an agency or a unit of an agency that's completed very few loans or guarantees in the past decade. Why are you confident that you can propel the industry, the, the sector, this, this agency uh, forward again after a decade of being mostly dormant in terms of completing new deals? Yeah, I mean, basically the loan programs office got uh, addicted to the the era stimulus uh, sort of set of events, right, where credit had dried up. Right. So a lot of these perfect deals, right, solar and wind projects with 20 year power purchase agreements with credit worthy utilities or the Vodal nuclear plant where Southern Company is guaranteeing that loan from its corporate, uh, you know, balance sheet. Um, those are not deals coming to our office anymore. <laughs> those deals are going to, you know, European investors who are offering negative 1% interest rates. And so, so the role that we play has to evolve to these next set of technologies. And I think the loan programs office largely didn't believe that it had the air cover over the last 10 years to do that. And so now when you think about what we're looking at around geothermal or long duration storage, including pumped hydro or small modular reactors, micro reactors, right? All of these next generation sectors where uh, the private markets are still very nervous about playing a big role there. They have different characteristics. Like for instance, some of these places have, uh, like in the biofuel space, you have low carbon fuel standard credits from the state of California, which are merchant, right? No one's giving you a 10 year offtake agreement on those credits. And so figuring out how to take merchant risk, figuring out how to take, if you build it, they will come risk. Some of those risks are things that our office didn't know 
that it had the political cover to do. But our secretary has been so uh, strong in her leadership that she has given us the flexibility to really work hard to reindustrialize our country, bring bring good union jobs back to our country, and you know, and and simplify the supply chains. Got it. How do you plan to deploy more than forty billion dollars in loans and loan guarantees? Well, as I suggested, I think that we have to focus, right? I mean, anyone can apply for the money. So, you know, we're always open for business and everyone has the right to apply if they believe that they qualify. But we've identified 12 to 15 sectors that we believe there's more than $2 billion worth of near-term opportunities, projects that are shovel ready basically, or can be within the next 12 months that can come to us, right? So some of those companies are companies that have recently raised equity. We've seen a lot of those in the paper. Um, and so they're building a manufacturing facility. Well, they can work with us to help build that manufacturing facility and get low cost debt to help stretch their equity farther. Um, there's a lot of uh, technologies that uh, are caught in a chicken and egg situation, right? Like transmission, uh, a lot of transmission lines, um, they they can't get fully subscribed with generators who want to use them until after they start construction. But traditional debt providers really want all of that, that uh, offtake in place before they provide debt. So we can solve some of that chicken and egg situation. And so when you think about what we need to do to put that money out the door is we need to identify places where what we have to offer is resonating with um, with potential borrowers. Got it. You mentioned a few sectors you're looking at. What's the full scope or breadth of sectors that could qualify for funding from your your agency? Yeah, it's a great question. So just to maybe bring it back a step, we have three main programs. We have Title 17. Uh, the uh, Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program, and then we have uh, the Tribal Energy Program, right? So Title 17 is is the traditional program that people know, which is project finance. It's got a renewable energy and energy efficiency title, a nuclear title, and then a fossil energy title. So that's where we're doing carbon sequestration and storage, green hydrogen, you know, some of these kinds of uh, uh, technologies, right? Um, the ATVM program, the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program, is really where we funded Tesla, Ford Motor Company, Fisker. And so these are the kinds of places where you're supporting electric vehicles Vehicles, the battery manufacturing industry, and then you've got uh, critical minerals, right? So lithium, uh, nickel, cobalt, et cetera, that we would like to process here, including recycling, by the way, of those materials out of existing uh, facilities. And then the tribal energy program is really around figuring out how to get credit into tribal energy. There's been a very successful program with First Nations in Canada around really helping to bring wealth creation to the First Nations through um, our decarbonization efforts. And we're doing the same here in the United States where we're bringing um, you know, uh, low cost debt to projects that are 51% or more owned by the tribes. Got it. We got a question from the audience. Uh, they ask, which clean energy sector uh, just lost the question. Uh, are you uh, would benefit most from new funding? Which sector is on the, the is on the verge of becoming a staple in fighting climate change? Yeah, I think that as you know, folks know me from my previous uh, comments and efforts. I'd say I, I still hold the same point of view, right? So we have. I'm within the Department of Energy, and the Department of Energy is excited about lots of things, right? But I would say that what I'm excited about are things that I can get done in the next two years, right? Not things that are 10 years from now, right? Uh, I'll leave that to other people to be excited about. So, so some of the things that I think we can really get done over the next two years are uh, transmission projects. I think we can get green hydrogen going. I think we can get several projects in the carbon sequestration and storage space going. My sense is, is that there's a lot of renewable energy uh, programs that we can do around uh, distributed energy resources in the first quarter 2222 and making sure that distributed appliances can really participate in wholesale markets. So I think that is a whole area of innovation we can lean into. Certainly the electric vehicle sector is ready for prime time. There's a lot of equity that's been raised over the last 12 months. And so getting cheap debt to match that equity, I think will be essential to be able to really reindustrialize our country and making sure that we're not, you know, just importing all that stuff from Asia. Um, and then I, I would say that the last area that I'm very 
hopeful around, I think people have been writing off too quickly around the small modular reactors and the micro reactors. I think when you think about how many investments we made in 2015, um, we actually have a lot of those technologies that come out the other side. We have two valid applications within the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So I think there's a lot of innovation there that is ready for mainstream capital, which is what we provide. You mentioned EVs, and that's a good segue to our poll question. Uh, we asked, uh, what green technology innovation are you most excited about? And EVs, green transportation, uh, one out, edging, carbon capture, and storage, and finally, green agriculture. Jigger, did these results surprise you? Uh, well, the green agriculture uh, surprises me. I think in general, on the green agriculture side, most people forget um, how carbon intensive our agriculture industry really is. And when you think about all of the great work that USDA is doing, uh, the US Department of Agriculture is doing on uh, regenerative ag, uh, figuring out how we decarbonize tractors uh, and all of the, the Israeli technology that we're bringing into um, you know, water management, et cetera, in the United States, I just think it's an area of huge amount of innovation and change. And it's largely left off these lists. So I'm glad that Bloomberg uh, audience participants are actually seeing that's on the list. Zena from Rome asks, what's the single fastest way for the planet to reach zero carbon emissions by 2050? Yeah, that's a misleading question. There is no single fastest <laughs> way. I, think the, the, I mean, I really do think that the Paris Agreement matters, that each country does put together their own country decarbonization plans. Because one of the things that I've learned a long time ago is that technology doesn't drive what we do, right? And it's something that I think is at odds with what you hear from other you know, tech billionaires and others who really want to be technology forward. This is a stakeholder engagement process, right? As the president's talked about, we have to figure out labor, we have to figure out environmental justice, we have to figure out economic development in uh, place-based initiatives, as the secretary has been talking about. And it's only through all of those people being satisfied that you have an enduring coalition of support to really move projects forward. A lot of these projects, as you know, are controversial in their communities, right? People don't necessarily want to live next to wind farms. They don't want to, next to necessarily live next to a natural gas plant, right? And so where do we put all this industrial equipment? Well, it requires good conversations, good stakeholder engagement. And sometimes that means that there is a mix of technologies that one locality wants to do, which is slightly different than what the academic researcher said would be the cheapest possible way to get to decarbonization. But I think it's important for us to recognize that you can't invest in these things at trillion dollar scale um, across the world without that level of engagement. Got it. We got another question from the audience. Um, how can the loan programs office collaborate with private financiers to leverage more funding for scaling up proven technologies? Yeah, it's a great question. And so we have an innovation title within Title 17. So we're supposed to be funding things that are innovative. But our version of innovation is really broad. So for instance, offshore wind qualifies, even though it's fairly mainstream in Europe, it hasn't been done much here. And um, you know, today the turbines are 10 megawatts in size instead of five uh, megawatts in size. And so, so innovation is you know, quite a broad title for us. I think that in general, what we're finding from the private sector is that there's a huge dearth of equity. So we actually are generally first to the party for a lot of these technologies, particularly in biofuels, for instance, where you have an enormous amount of investment that went in in 2008, 9, and 10. And now you've got uh, all this success on the other side. Um, and they're ready for plants two, three, and four. And a lot of the private sector players have gone from an equity standpoint, right? And so I think we're probably 50 to $100 billion short on the equity side for project equity over the next 10 years. And so, it, so a lot of what we're doing with the private sector is talking to them about why are they you know, disengaged from these other sectors, which our own modeling groups have shown are necessary to, to meet the president's goal by 2035 and 2050. And, you know, a lot of them are just saying, look, we don't have experience in that area. We don't really want to gain that experience. And so we're, you know, just bowing out of those sectors. And so finding folks who really want to understand these new sectors, get better returns on equity uh, has proven to be a challenge. And so we're engaging with the private sector to do that. Got it. How soon should we expect to see deals come out of LPO 
on your watch? Well, they're going to come out when they come out. I, I don't know that I can predict that yet. As, as we started from the beginning of the interview, I'm still only six weeks into the job, so I gotta, I gotta learn before I can um, answer those kinds of questions. But I would say that we have a very robust pipeline. I, I would say that we already have about twenty billion dollars of deals that are actively going through the pipeline, and another forty billion dollars worth of deals that have been in pre-consultations that have suggested that they want to apply. So I think we have a very large number of people that are re-engaging with the secretary's leadership where she's been saying since her confirmation hearing that we're open for business. And so I think a lot of people have heard that call and are starting to engage with us. Um, so I'm pretty excited. I definitely think that we have a lot of interest in the program. We will be able to you know, be quite active. Got it. LPO is probably best known for a big success in Tesla, but also a big failure in Solyndra. Are you concerned that some loans or loan guarantees your office makes will fail? No, I'm not concerned at all. I mean, the the thing about Solyndra, which I find quite problematic and puzzling, right, is that, you know, I think the, the, the better deal to focus on is Fisker, right? Like we funded several players in the EV space, right? We had Tesla, we had Fisker, we had others. And, you know, Fisker didn't succeed, right? But Tesla did. And so the question is, what is the what do the American people think around the essential role that the loan programs office played in creating Tesla? Right? Does it think that the risk that we took and the swings at bat that we took, as the secretary likes to say, were worth it? Right, Because ultimately, if you're reindustrializing our country and creating good manufacturing jobs in our country, um, that means that you're going to have to bet on several players in the field. Now, we have to take good bets, calculated bets. For sure, we have to take advantage of global market conditions. We make sure that we're not like um, making bad investments. But at the end of the day, we failure will be actually a feature, not a bug, right? Like if we're doing our job correctly, we should be having some failures in the portfolio. That's the only way we're going to find the next Tesla and make sure that we actually show that level of leadership, not only in our R&D departments where we've proven ourselves to be top notch, but also in our commercialization department, where I think in years past, we've outsourced commercialization to Europe or to China or to other countries and said, well, we'll bring it back once it's been cheaper. And you know, today, I think what the president is saying and the secretary are saying is, no, we want them to commercialize here. We want the American people to benefit from all those jobs and all that manufacturing. Interesting. You know, one of the critiques of uh, LPO a decade ago was that LPO picked winners and losers. How do you sort of educate the American public that that might happen? There might be some winners, there might be some losers. Well, I think you're asking a slightly different question than the last one you just asked, right? And so, like, we will have failure. I think we've admitted that. You know, the Congress has given us money in the form of credit subsidy. That's the whole point of it, is sort of a loan loss reserve. And they, they allocated $10 billion of loan loss reserve to us, and we basically only lost, uh, you know, less than, I think, 10% of the amount of money they projected, right? So so when you think about um, how much risk they want us to take and how much risk we took, we didn't take enough risk, according to the Congress. And I think when you think about um, uh, winners and losers, right? I mean, we have plenty of money, so we can fund all of the winners, right? So like, we're, we're, you know, winners and losers is a, is a combination of like, hey, we only have one prize to provide and, you know, there are 10 great applicants and we only give, give it to one of them. No, at this point, we have... We have a lot of money, so like we can actually help everyone who applies who meets our criteria. So I wouldn't say we're picking winners and losers. We are making sure that people meet the criteria set by Congress and interpreted by the White House and you know the Office of Management Budget and the Secretary. So, so like we're we're funding everyone who meets that criteria. And I think if we run out of money, we can go back to the Congress. And my sense is that they will uh, want us to continue to fund American innovators to to create good quality jobs in the United States. Got it. We've got another question from the audience. Uh, the question is, are you looking into bonds or other innovative finance frameworks to gain more investments? Well, right now, we're a bridge to bankability, right? And so a lot of the people who we are a bridge to, that is what they do, is they actually uh, use bonds and other innovative finance frameworks to serve those customers after we've demonstrated the asset class is low risk. Uh, so I think that is the job of the private markets to do that. I think, you know, as the National Green Bank 
gets through the um, U.S. Congress and the American Jobs Plan, you could imagine that you know some of these tools may be something that the National Green Bank uh, utilizes. Got it. Uh, one of the big focuses uh, has been taking older gas fire power plants, coal fire power plants, and finding ways to rem remove emissions from them and keep them alive. Does LPO have any mechanism to try to finance uh, carbon capture for older fossil fuel-based power plants? Yeah, I wouldn't say that we want to do carbon capture for older fossil fuel based power plants. I think in general, we want to do carbon capture for technologies that we believe are essential to providing Americans a uh, modern lifestyle, uh, but, um, you know, are heavy on carbon. And so whether it's, you know, ethanol plants or ammonia facilities or other facilities, we believe that those facilities will have an essential role through 2050. And my sense is, is that, you know, there's going to have to be carbon capture and sequestration technologies ready to go for those. Um, the other thing that we're doing, though, is interestingly enough, there's a ton of coal plants and natural gas plants that are within five years of their end of life. And a lot of investors are looking at, hey, um, can they be repurposed in the green energy revolution? And the answer has been resoundingly yes, but we're in this middle period where a lot of providers of debt because of ESG goals and others don't want to fund this repurposing of coal and natural gas assets because there's a short stub period where they own coal and natural gas assets. And so we definitely have been asked to fill the void there. And that that sounds like something that we can do. You mentioned briefly earlier justice. Uh, how critical is the question of justice, whether it's social or environmental or both, uh, to LPO as you consider how to, you know, use the 40 billion authority you have? Yeah, it's a good question. And we'll have some big announcements around this in, in about a month or so. But what I would say is that the clean energy industry is not going to be allowed to go from $200 billion of deployment a year to $1 trillion a year, which we need to be able to decarbonize our electricity grid and our economy without meeting the needs of environmental justice, labor, and other major constituents within our society. And that's why I think making sure that what we're doing has broader appeal to the American uh, people is so important. Got it. We're getting toward the end of our session. I want to ask you about the uh, number of people you're working with or companies you're working with. When you came in, how many parties were you working with and what is it now? Yeah, I mean, in general, I'd say that, you know, we've had a huge increase. I mean, you know, we had a lot of folks who had been uh, interested in loan programs office before I came in, but we probably only had, you know, 10 to 20 really uh, serious applications in. And, and that number has grown tenfold since the secretary has, you know, been confirmed. And so I think her announcement there and her message of deploy, deploy, deploy has really inspired a lot of people to take a second look at the loan programs office. Is there a big gap in financing? Like there's a lot of interest right now from possible SPACs, uh, institutional investors in Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, banks want to do renewables. W what's the need for LPO? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We certainly have lots of money floating around the process. For those of us who've been in the sector for 25 years, it's never been a better time to raise money for your company. Um, but I'd say that, you know, an equity heavy deployment at trillion dollar scale isn't going to work. I think we all know that. And so there's only so much equity that you could raise and still give your equity investors a reasonable rate of return that they're expecting for all that risk they're taking. And so there needs to be at some point a senior debt piece that matches that equity. And right now that senior debt piece is missing. So it's it's healthy in uh, you know the solar and wind space. It might be healthy in some other uh, more mature sectors, but certainly it's not healthy in some of the sectors that we talked about. Um, and so until that senior debt piece comes in place, I think we'll have a hard time uh, to get from the million dollar scale that we're at today to the billion dollar scale we need to get to, and then eventually the trillion dollar scale that's essential to decarbonize our planet. I know you're new to LPO, but have you been working with Wall Street at all, educating them what you're doing and how they can help? Or is that a secondary or tertiary piece? We are educating Wall Street, but as most of us who've been around the block for 25 years know, Wall Street is not the most proactive uh, group on that bridge to bankability, right? The bridge to bankability is, is really leaned in by SBA lenders. 
uh, they have been the bedrock of taking advantage of uh, favorable government programs. And then you've got the smaller regional banks who, you know, will actually jump in next. And then you have insurance companies who jump in after that. And then Wall Street, Wall Street's generally the last group to jump in once they actually see $20 billion scale and they want to take it to $2.5 trillion, as J.P. Morgan Chase recently announced. And so I think in general, Wall Street's always going to be on our list, but they're not the next step in that bridge to bankability usually.